At the beginning of 1968, NASA was preparing to launch the unmanned Apollo 5. A Saturn 1B would lift a very different payload to low Earth orbit. It had been 12 months since three astronauts were incinerated, preparing for the Apollo 1 launch. Supporters of the American space program feared that inquiries in both houses of Congress, set up after the tragedy, would axe the Apollo program. But President Lyndon Johnson, who had decorated two of the Apollo 1 astronauts, had influence on Capitol Hill. And his ongoing support for NASA helped quell any political backlash. Work on a redesigned Apollo capsule was progressing. But the rush to meet President Kennedy's end of the decade deadline sat uncomfortably with the need for precision and quality. All flammable materials had been eliminated from the spacecraft and spacesuits. At launch, the astronauts would no longer breathe pure oxygen and the complex hatch had been replaced by a one-piece unit that could be opened rapidly. More than 1,400 wiring problems had been corrected. But there was one vital piece of the Apollo program that remained untested. Nothing like it had ever flown. The lunar landing craft, known as the Lunar Module, had been plagued with development problems and its first test flight had been delayed by almost 12 months. It consisted of a descent stage that would remain on the moon and an ascent stage that would return the astronauts to the Apollo Command Module, waiting in lunar orbit. Each part had its own engine. In testing, the descent engine had not been burning smoothly. Of all the Apollo hardware, this engine had to respond to the most delicate control. Rigorous testing finally solved this problem and LM-1 was prepared for flight. The unmanned Apollo 5 would test the craft in Earth orbit. The lunar module, packed beneath the unique nose cone, had no landing legs, as these would have further delayed delivery. And after pressure tests on LM-5 had blown out a window, LM-1 had aluminium panels instead of glass in its windows. RTC, will you site select? Guido. On January the 22nd, 1968, the two-stage Saturn 1B stood fueled and waiting on Cape Canaveral Pad 37B. Seven, six, five, four, three, six. This mission Go would be judged IP. entirely on telemetry, on the electronic flow from sensors monitoring every system in the booster and the lunar module. At the end of the flight, nothing would return to Earth. NASA needed to know how the lunar module's descent and ascent engines would function in space. A software problem shut down a descent engine burn after only four seconds, but Mission Control were able to reprogram it. After 11 hours, all systems had been checked and the mission declared a success. Astronauts would only have one opportunity to fly the craft and two different types of simulator were developed for training. The Lunar Landing Research Facility at Langley exposed astronauts to the kind of decisions they would have to make during the last 50 metres of their descent to the lunar surface. But this was a bit like a carnival ride and the astronauts preferred the free-flying simulator known as the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle or LLRV. It was nicknamed the Flying Bedstead. A gimbal jet engine provided partial lift, 
that helped the craft behave as though it was under the influence of lunar gravity. The rest of the lift and the control came from throttleable rockets, similar to those in the lunar module. Just like any other aircraft, it had to be thoroughly tested, and NASA test pilot Joe Walker made the first series of flights in 1964. It could take off and fly using the jet engine and then be switched to SIN mode when it would behave like the lunar module. In 1967, Neil Armstrong was the first astronaut to fly the prototype. The following year, he flew a modified version with cockpit walls that limited his view to something like he'd seen through the lunar module window. When switched into sim mode, the response to pilot control became sluggish, as close as experts could make it, to the way the lunar module would behave in lunar gravity. Later, astronauts would call the LLRV the unsung hero of the Apollo program, but NASA administrators were having second thoughts. It would not be the last crash. Of five LLRVs and its derivatives, only one was left at the end of the Apollo program. The second Saturn V launch was the final unmanned Apollo mission, Apollo 6. Mission objectives included monitoring the amount of vibration a fully loaded Saturn V would experience. It was carrying a dummy lunar module and a hybrid command and service module. Like Apollo 4, it was not just covered with sensors, but cameras too. Being the first time the Saturn V was carrying a full load, engineers were keen to see how it performed. There were problems. Two minutes into the flight, vibrations ran through the length of the rocket, causing damage to the adapter housing the lunar module. When the second stage took over, two of its engines cut out early, affecting the final orbit. The third stage had to burn longer to compensate. Inside the command module, a camera was trained on the window. And at various parts of the astronaut's instrument panel. After three orbits, the upper stage failed to reignite as commanded. NASA wanted to test the capsule in a high altitude, high speed re-entry so the command and service module separated from the upper stage and used its own engine to boost it to a higher orbit for a faster re-entry. Though Apollo 6 was troubled with technical difficulties, NASA understood the vibration problems well and was able to redesign various subsystems according to the information gathered during this mission. Finally, NASA was ready to launch another manned mission, and by October 1968, Apollo 7 stood ready for launch. It had a completely redesigned command module, and the astronauts would wear a completely new spacesuit. After the Apollo 1 fire, the new A7L suit was fire resistant with an outer layer of Teflon coated beta fabric. A one piece fishbowl helmet that did away with the need for a visor and a visor seal was fitted to the shoulders, allowing head movement and providing superior visibility. 
On the morning of October the 11th, 1968, three astronauts were prepared for the Apollo program's first manned flight. It would be the program's last Saturn 1B mission and would not carry a lunar module. Veteran of the Mercury and Gemini programs Wally Shira and two first-time astronauts, Don Isley and Walter Cunningham, would be NASA's first astronauts to fly in almost two years. Four, three, two, we have ignition. Commit liftoff, we have liftoff. This is launch control, we have cleared the tower. Roger, tower clear. 12 seconds out and the roll program has commenced. The bigger Apollo capsule provided a more comfortable environment necessary for long duration flights that were required to get to the moon. The crew could take off or put on their bulky spacesuits as required and they didn't have to remain in their couches as in the Mercury and Gemini spacecraft. Soon after reaching orbit, the command and service module separated from the S-4B upper stage. On a moon mission, this would normally house the lunar module. One of the four adapter panels had not opened fully. On subsequent flights, these would separate completely from the upper stage. The spacecraft turned around and practiced docking using a visual reference target that would usually be mounted on the lunar module. Not long into the mission, Shira came down with a cold and in the confines of the capsule, it quickly spread to the other two. In zero gravity, the nasal congestion was not clearing in the same way it would on Earth and the crew were very uncomfortable. Eating became a sore point with the astronauts. Though the food had improved since the earlier space missions, the freeze-dried and bite-sized rehydratable meals fell short of what they considered acceptable. The demands on this mission were considerable. Tense interchanges between the sick astronauts and mission control were not uncommon. They had to fire the service module engine no less than eight times. Public relations reached new heights on the mission. A series of TV broadcasts from the capsule were watched around the world. At one point, Shira refused to switch on the TV equipment because the schedule was too crowded and the crew had not eaten. Preparing for re-entry, a new dispute broke out. The astronauts refused to wear their helmets during the return to Earth. With their colds, they worried about the rapid changes in pressure. They wanted to hold their noses and blow to equalize the pressure. Aboard the carrier Essex, the Apollo 7 astronauts were treated as returning heroes. But they did not receive the usual NASA honors, and Shira, Isley and Cunningham never flew again. Carbon dioxide is a small but vital component of our planet's atmosphere. The carbon that makes up the vast bulk of plant matter is extracted from this atmospheric CO2. In turn, the plants replenish the atmosphere's oxygen. All animal life breathes this oxygen and exhales CO2. This is called the carbon cycle. Our modern industrial societies rely on oxygen as well, and by burning coal and petroleum products, we produce the energy that powers our affluent lifestyles. This process produces carbon dioxide too. There has been a measurable increase in atmospheric CO2 since formal monitoring commenced. Higher levels of CO2 mean that the planet's blanket of air lets less of the Earth's heat escape out into space, prompting a slight rise in the planet's temperature. This has led to visible reductions in the Arctic sea ice and in the retreat of glaciers at the edges of the Antarctic continent. 
Using weather readings from around the world, NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies says that 2014 was the hottest year since 1880. The Goddard report revealed that nine of the ten hottest years on record have all been in this century. To understand the geographic distribution of the sources of CO2 and the regions that remove it from the air, NASA commissioned a satellite equipped with an extremely accurate suite of spectrometers to analyse the intensity of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. This was the second time NASA had built an orbiting carbon observatory. The initial satellite, OCO, launched in 2009, failed to reach orbit when the payload fairing didn't separate from the spacecraft and it could not achieve orbit. A duplicate orbiting carbon observatory, known as OCO2, successfully went into polar orbit in July 2014. Its north-south orbit allows it to overfly every point on the Earth's surface at least once every 16 days. It makes measurements in three different modes. Nadir mode samples the atmosphere directly below it, giving a global picture of the swirling concentrations of CO2. This map from Goddard was compiled using ground-based measurements. Data from OCO2 will deliver far greater detail. A second type of operation, target mode, enables the observatory to focus on a single point of interest allowing it to gather multiple readings which can be compared with ground measurements made at the same site. The third, glint mode, sees the satellite sample close to the point on the Earth's surface that directly reflects the sun's rays. This further enhances the spectrometer's sensitivity, especially when sampling over the oceans. And OCO2 can detect oxygen concentrations which will give a clear indication of the growth rates of plants and their ability to act as carbon sinks. OCO2 will remain operational for at least two years. In the early 1950s, NASA's predecessor, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics carried out in-flight zero-gravity tests. By flying in a parabolic arc, an aircraft could offset the force of gravity for a short time. Early tests in a Lockheed XP-80 were rudimentary. Flying the precise parabola to maximise the zero-g time was difficult for pilots it's hard to know what they learned from this kitten experiment. By 1959, at the commencement of NASA's Mercury program, parabolic flight was well understood and it became a fundamental part of astronaut training. To achieve the effect, the plane climbs at a 45 degree angle. As the thrust is reduced and the aircraft's nose drops, passengers experience weightlessness until the plane's nose reaches a downward angle of 30 degrees when the pilot pulls out of the dive. In the mid-1960s, NASA employed two KC-135 aircraft for zero-g training. These are the military version of the Boeing 707. They were nicknamed the Weightless Wonders. During the Gemini program, astronauts were now required to walk in space and the zero-gravity training flights came into their own. Before Michael Collins made his spacewalk on Gemini 10, he trained extensively in these short bursts of zero-g. In early preparations for the moon landings, the flight paths were altered to simulate lunar gravity. 
Information gathered on these flights was used to modify spacesuit design to cope with the most difficult situations. Other scenarios worried NASA planners too. If an astronaut wearing his bulky spacesuit and heavy life support system fell over, would he be able to get back to his feet? The aircraft, flying a shallower parabola, was able to simulate lunar gravity for longer durations than for zero G. Russia's Ilyushin IL-76 serves as the largest zero gravity aircraft. Today, such planes are used for far more than training astronauts. They serve as microgravity laboratories where equipment is tested and experiments are undertaken. Operators are even offering zero gravity joyrides. The European Space Agency, in partnership with Kness, has six zero-g campaigns each year flying out of Merignac Airport in the south of France. The A300 aircraft used for these flights is soon to be replaced by an A310. The rear of the aircraft, known as the free floating area, is padded and fitted with handrails. It is equipped with fixed benches for technical and biological experiments, which are the prime reason for the flights. Recently, the International Space Station began using a 3D printer. To make certain that it would function properly in microgravity, it was first tested aboard this zero-g flight. Human physiology, fluid mechanics, biology, combustion and basic physics are among the most studied disciplines. By the end of the 1960s, NASA was prepared to send astronauts beyond Earth orbit, pushing hard to reach the moon, but they were taking risks that today would be unthinkable. In October 1968, a Saturn V began inching its way to Cape Kennedy's Launch Complex 39, Pad A. There had been two previous Saturn V launches, but this one, Apollo 8, would be the first to carry a crew. Originally intended as a manned test of the lunar module in Earth orbit, flight objectives were radically readjusted when a lunar module could not be ready in time. The flight crew was changed too. Jim Lovell was the command module pilot. And though there was no lunar module, Bill Anders was the designated lunar module pilot. Frank Borman would command the revamped mission. The original Apollo 8 astronauts were moved to Apollo 9. They would be the first men to leave Earth orbit and fly around the moon, and these astronauts had had very little time to retrain for this new mission. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero. We have commit. We have. We have lift off. Lift off at 7:51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the tower. On the previous Saturn V, harmonic vibration had caused the early shutdown of two engines. Action taken to rectify the problem saw a flawless launch for Apollo 8. Eleven and a half minutes after launch, the spacecraft, still attached to the upper stage, achieved orbit with both the ground staff and space crew entering an intense period of system checking. This was a risky mission. A less public reason it had been brought forward came from the CIA. 
intelligence suggested that Russia was preparing a lunar orbital mission. Power 8 Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Power 8, you are go for TLI. Over. Roger, understand. We're go for TLI. TLI, Translunar Injection. Soon after, the S-4B upper stage fired, pushing Apollo 8 out of Earth orbit toward the Moon. Now, a new problem arose. Frank Borman began to feel sick and threw up, which was even more unpleasant in zero gravity. Because of the attitude of the spacecraft, they could not see the Moon, but through the round window, they began seeing more and more of the Earth. Soon they would be the first people to see our planet in its entirety. However, this window soon fogged with gas from the oils in the chemical sealant. Apollo 7 had also suffered from this problem. As Apollo 8 approached the Moon, the crew prepared for an engine burn that would place the craft in lunar orbit. The main engine had to fire for four minutes when the command module was behind the Moon, out of radio contact. This was the first time that the crew got a decent view of the Moon. William Anders prepared to photograph the lunar surface. An important part of the mission was to document areas such as the Sea of Tranquility in preparation for future lunar landings. Then on the fourth orbit, they saw something astounding. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, is that pretty? After this mission, it was often said that they went to the moon and discovered the Earth. You got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color quick. Oh man, that's Hurry. great. Where is it? Quick. After 10 orbits of the moon, Apollo 8 fired its main engine and began its return Down here. to Earth. Just grab me a color. A color exterior. Hurry up. During its cruise back, Bill Anders captured more pictures of the Earth. The Apollo 8 astronauts returned as heroes. Their flight around the moon had put NASA's space effort back on the front pages. But it was the end of 1968, and there was only one year left to reach the moon within President Kennedy's deadline. Just two months later, Russell Schweikart, Dave Scott, and Commander Jim McDivitt were preparing for the next Apollo mission. Apollo 9 would be the first test of the complete Apollo system. Till now, the lunar module had made only one flight when it was tested without a crew. This would be the first time two spacecraft had been launched together. And, like all Apollo missions, it would be far more complex than the mission that had preceded it. A February launch had been delayed to March the 3rd, 1969, to allow the crew to recover from a virus they had contracted. Though Apollo 9 would remain in Earth orbit, the crew faced a punishing schedule. Not only would they be the first to fly the lunar module, but a spacewalk had been planned to test the new self-contained life support system. After reaching orbit, the command and service module separated from the S-4B upper stage that carried the lunar module. They docked with the lunar lander to withdraw it from the S-4B. After separation, Apollo 9 backed away to a safe distance and ground control sent the discarded stage on a course towards the sun. The next few days were spent in manoeuvres, with the main engine being fired five times, changing the orbit in preparation for testing of the lunar module and to simulate mid-course corrections that would be needed on a trip to the moon. The crew had removed the hatches and probes to clear the connecting tunnel between the command module and the lunar module that had been named Gumdrop and Spider. 
These were the first NASA craft to be named since Gemini 3's Molly Brown. Every aspect of the linked spacecraft was closely monitored in mission control. Soon, McDivitt and Schweikart would fly in a machine that had no capability of returning to the ground and nothing could go wrong. In case something did go wrong and the two craft could not dock again, a spacewalk had been planned to test an outside transfer between Spider and Gumdrop. This was the Apollo program's first spacewalk and Rusty Schweikart was only connected by a nylon tether. All his oxygen and electrical power came from the portable life support system he wore on his back. Okay, Dave, come on out. Both spacecraft had been depressurized, and while Schweikart was busy at the lunar module, Dave Scott was retrieving an experimental sample from the yeah, outside of the, the command sample. module. This spacewalk was cut short because Schweikart was suffering from space sickness. Okay, we're nice and stable with respect to you. The next day, Spider and Gumdrop separated for the first time. It's a nice looking machine. Using its descent engine, Spider, the lunar module, withdrew to a distance of around 150 kilometers. The next time Dave Scott in the command module saw the lunar module, it had jettisoned its lower descent stage. All engine tests for both stages had worked well, and NASA was developing confidence in their new moon craft. Before redocking with the command module, McDivitt and Schweikart did a complex series of pirouettes to allow Scott to inspect Spider from every angle. When the three astronauts were reunited, the lunar module was jettisoned, eventually to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. They spent several more days in orbit, photographing the Earth before splashing down in the Atlantic. NASA had just nine more months to meet President Kennedy's end of the decade deadline for putting a man on the moon. But there was one more step before they made the first attempt to land. Oh, our stage is pressurized. Apollo 10 would take a lunar module to the moon and descend toward the lunar surface, but it would not land. In keeping with NASA's very tight schedule, it had a long list of questions to answer, and the mission would have the most experienced crew of any Apollo mission so far. Lunar module pilot Gene Cernan had flown on Gemini 9. Command module pilot John Young had flown on Gemini 3 and 10 and Commander Tom Stafford had flown on Gemini 6 and 9. One of the important problems that this mission had to solve was linked with the Moon's uneven gravitation. Previous manned and unmanned lunar orbital missions had discovered that variable concentrations of mass within the Moon had caused lunar orbits to be erratic. NASA needed to map these irregularities to fully understand how their spacecraft would perform in lunar orbit. Nine. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on. Five, four, three, two. All engines running. Launch commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff 49 minutes past the hour. Apollo 10 would be a complete rehearsal for the first lunar landing. It would be the second Apollo craft to leave Earth orbit. Docking with and extraction of the lunar module, which had been the major focus of previous missions, was becoming commonplace. Again, it's looking real stable to us. We show you close and finally. Got two grays. 
Roger. Apollo 10 was the first spacecraft to make colour television transmissions, and they pulled in audiences of around one billion. Do whatever he says. As in the previous mission, Apollo 10 had two spacecraft each needing a different call sign. The astronauts had elected to call the mothership Charlie Brown and the lunar module Snoopy after the popular Peanuts cartoon strip of the time. After this, the space crews were asked to choose names that had a little more gravitas. When they disappeared behind the moon, they fired the main engine for six minutes, which the astronauts described as being interminable. The craft went into lunar orbit as planned, and six hours later, Stafford and Cernan entered Snoopy to prepare it for descent toward the lunar surface. It was teeming with weightless flakes of mylar insulation that had come loose when the connecting tunnel had pressurised. This caused itching for the rest of the flight. But there were more problems. Charlie Brown, Houston, uh, we're concerned about this yaw bias uh, in the limb and uh, apparent slippage of the uh, docking ring. We'd like you to uh, disable... The lunar module was more than three degrees out of alignment with the command module, and air pressure in the tunnel between the two craft could not be released. Houston was worried that undocking now could damage the latches that held them together. Engineers on the ground decided that anything less than six degrees was not a problem, and Snoopy was given the all clear to undock. This was the first time a lunar module had flown in the lunar environment for which it had been designed. Mission planners were concerned that Stafford and Cernan might try to seize the opportunity to make an unauthorised landing, so Snoopy had been short-fuelled. If they did land, they could not get back. For the next eight hours, John Young would be alone in Charlie Brown. Houston, Houston. Charlie Brown, how do you read on that gate? Over. Charlie Brown, Houston. Over. Great, sounds great, we copy. Snoopy dropped lower and lower, passing directly over the proposed landing site for the next Apollo mission and travelling more than 500 kilometres from the mothership. But just before they were due to jettison the descent stage, a guidance setting switch was in the wrong mode and the lunar module began gyrating wildly. By dumping the descent stage and switching to manual control, Tom Stafford was able to regain stability. Charlie, how was the stage good, huh? Wait till that thing blinks. Charlie Brown, uh, Houston, they got hey, staging. Uh, they uh, had a wild uh, gyration, though, but they got it under control. Over. The rendezvous went according to plan and Apollo 10 remained in lunar orbit for another 29 hours, mapping anomalies in the lunar gravity before returning to the Earth. But even as they were near the moon, another Saturn V had been rolled out to the launch pad. Apollo 11 was being prepared for the first attempt at a landing on the moon. Allumage Vulcain. Allumage de ZAP. ESA, the European Space Agency, launches light, medium and heavy lift rockets from its facility in French Guiana, but it has no ability to bring vehicles back through the Earth's atmosphere for a safe landing. The Intermediate Experimental Vehicle, or IXV, is being developed so that ESA can master the techniques of controlled re-entry from low Earth orbit. The IXV uses the lifting body concept in combination with ceramic and carbon fibre thermal protection. 
Though this is a more complex technique than the common ablative heat shield made of plastic resin that dissipates heat as it vaporises, ESA wants to test a vehicle that offers greater control for more accuracy in landing. The concept vehicle will function autonomously. It is equipped with thrusters to maintain the correct attitude before it reaches the Earth's atmosphere. As it descends to 120 kilometres, the IXV encounters the upper levels of the atmosphere. At this point, it is travelling at a speed approaching 27,000 kilometres per hour. Two flat actuators keep the craft correctly aligned during this part of the re-entry. There are unanswered questions about this part of the journey where the oxygen and nitrogen molecules in the air become a high temperature plasma that does not obey the usual rules of aerodynamics. At an altitude of 26 kilometers, the craft will have slowed to 1600 kilometers per hour where the first of a series of supersonic parachutes is deployed. Though this technology is well understood, ESA still had to perform drop tests in the Mediterranean of a dummy IXV to see how their craft would behave. In mid-2014, the craft was prepared for its flight from the European spaceport in Kourou. The IXV was covered in more than 300 sensors to monitor its behaviour during all phases of its two-hour flight. Quatre, trois, deux, un, top. Allumage P80, décollage. It will be six months before the technical data has been fully understood and can be used in the design of a larger re-entry vehicle. For more than 15 years, Europe has been working on its own satellite navigation system. Called Galileo, the system is intended as a civilian, global location service as an alternative to the American GPS, which has military applications. This means average GPS users can have their service downgraded without notice. An in-orbit validation phase using four satellites was recently completed and new additions are being launched regularly until a constellation of 30 satellites is in service. Satellites 5 and 6, known as Dorisa and Melena, were sent up on August the 21st, 2014, aboard a Soyuz launcher. Initially, everything seemed to have gone well, but a design flaw in the Frigat upper stage allowed fuel lines to freeze during the extended cruise, and the satellites were delivered to elliptical rather than circular orbits. It took a while just to find where Dorisa and Milena were, and then ground staff began the detailed calculations involved in bringing the satellites back to usable positions. The low end of the orbit took both satellites through the Van Allen radiation belts, endangering the sensitive navigational electronics. Using the satellite's own manoeuvring thrusters, they were brought into usable circular orbits. After exhaustive systems checks, Dorisa and Milena were given a clean bill of health and, though their positions are not ideal, they will still be able to contribute to the Galileo constellation's function. Soon, the next two satellites, Adam and Anastasia, will go into orbit although their launch has been delayed by a thorough review of the Soyuz and its Frigat upper stage. It has been determined that the proximity of a cold helium line to the fuel line caused the freezing problem in the Frigat. <laughs> 